So let let's restart this uh, this session about uh, data analysis. So our next speaker is uh, Robert Rosati from uh, NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, and uh, Robert will talk about uh, the detecting uh, detecting premodal stochastic virtual background with LISA using Bayesian inference. Robert, can you share your slide and uh, and you can start when you want. Okay, can uh, everyone see that? Yes, we can see the slide. Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Ravi Rosati. I'm a postdoc at NASA Marshall working with Tyson. And I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, our uh, yeah, work in progress for detecting stochastic backgrounds and the LISA data. Um, the goal is eventually to integrate this into uh, the global fit pipeline. Um, so as uh, I'm sure this audience knows, there will be quite a lot of sources in the LISA band. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, discrete sources that merge in, in uh, you know, a finite amount of time. Um, but there also might be stochastic sources, which are too indistinct in time or frequency to result. Um, and we expect there to be a few uh, astrophysical sources, uh, the unresolved galactic binary foreground, uh, potentially an uh, extra galactic background from uh, LIGO Virgo bands um, and spiraling black holes. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we might as well uh, have some primordial sources, which is mostly what I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, so uh, if, if you've heard some of the cosmology talks during the symposium, um, you've heard a little, few, some, some about the primordial sources we might have in LISA. Um, uh, the dynamics of inflation, uh, depending on how it happened and how many fields were involved, can potentially create stochastic backgrounds. And um, yeah, my, my background's actually in inflationary cosmology, so I, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those signals in detail. Um, the the end of inflation reheating uh, can also create um, stochastic backgrounds, uh, depending on how exactly it happens. And as well, we know there were at least two phase transitions in the standard model, uh, although in the vanilla standard model, neither of them actually create gravitational waves. <laughs> uh, but there's good hope that the a modification to the standard model could make this electroweak phase transition uh, uh, create gravitational waves uh, by making it a first order phase transition. And if if that occurs, then uh, just you know from luck of the energies involved, it'll be directly in the Lisa band. Um, so there's yeah quite a wide variety of these signals, and I'll, I'll talk more about them later. Uh, but the basic detection strategy uh, we we have is is you really need to use uh, all three channels of of Lisa in order to distinguish uh, signal and noise by by their correlations. Um, so when you, when you form the AET TDI combinations, um, this T channel uh, you know, at least lets you at least at low frequency lets you probe um, the the instrument. Uh, without a uh, signal, <laughs> uh, which, which you really need to do in order to, to uh, distinguish them. And uh, there's some, some caveats about the T-channel. I think there's a talk about that tomorrow, which I'm gonna look forward to checking out. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, just using the AE and T-channel, you should be able to find all the excess power that's not instrument noise. Uh, if your noise model is correct. Um, but that doesn't really tell you anything about the physics involved. It doesn't tell you if that stochastic background is uh, from a galactic source, extragalactic, or primordial. Um, if the instrument has non-stationary noise, um, you have to take that into account as well. Uh, and if there are uh, you know, discrete merging sources um, that are finite in time, you know, you need to make sure that those aren't affecting you as well. Uh, 
So um, the procedure we have for now is to use stochastic templates. Uh, so these are just um, yeah, essentially frequency domain templates um, for a bunch of primordial sources. Uh, here's a handful of them plotted on the right. Um, and uh, the be great benefit of using templates like this is um, when you uh, have overlapping signals, you can decompose them. Uh, if, if the signal is there, you get automatic parameter inference. Uh, if it's not there, you get an automatic exclusion uh, plots. <laughs> um, and uh, we can do all this in a Bayesian way, so we can integrate it into the global fit uh, pipeline under development, and that will automatically take care of the uh, uh, discrete time uh, signals. Uh, so keep in mind this um, green curve here. This is like a, a model uh, of an electroweak phase transition. Um, so I'll come back to that. Um, so we, we've implemented this pipeline and have done some like preliminary uh, signal injections and recoveries. Um, so the uh, procedure for now has just been to do everything in the Fourier domain. Um, so this green here is the T channel and uh, orange and blue are the A and E channels. Um, and so we just uh, generate the data uh, using the standard noise curves and um, take the, the signal, multiply it by the standard instrument response. Um, and use that to create the expected uh, PST in each channel, um, which is would be this red curve here, which has a couple of injections uh, already. Um, and then from this red curve, we synthesize uh, Fourier domain data with the correct PST and a random phase, um, just by taking this X and Y to be unit normal random numbers. Uh, the likelihood in for a domain um, under the assumption of, you know, equal arm, the equal arm instrument uh, can just be written this way, where you compare the um, PSD of the Fourier domain data directly to this uh, theoretical covariance. Um, that was the red curve there on the last slide. Okay, so uh, it was... Um, yeah, try it, try it, try out. Um, so we, uh, uh, one of the first things we tried was pretty similar to this uh, Radler data challenge, which has uh, a simulation of the extragalactic background in it. Um, so uh, we're generating our own data in this case, um, and it's similar to that. And the amplitude of the background is, is quite high. Um, which I, I think current expectations are that it's a bit lower than this. Uh, and, and it's quite loud in the Lisa band. Um, we're able to recover it in only a few days of data, <laughs> assuming there are no other sources, right? But um, the uh, the error bar is quite large until, um, let's use a few years, to recover it a little bit more accurately. And the, uh, the sampling here was all done with Dynasty through Bilby. Uh, and the, the likelihood and all the templates are written in C. Uh, so it talks a lot about uh, primordial signals. So um, let's let's take a look at one of them. Uh, <clears throat> so the um, that green curve I showed you a few slides ago, the electroweak phase transition, or one model of it. Uh, can be written this way, uh, which is, is kind of a two-part broken power law, uh, expected to be, um, you know, fairly low uh, amplitude compared to the previous signal. Um, uh, and we can inject and recover that. Uh, for now, I, I put in a large amplitude to only use um, a short amount of time and data. I think this is two months of data. Um, we can uh, recover that well. And I think, uh, yeah, Mark Hindmarsh is, is giving a talk uh, concurrent with mine, actually, in one of the other parallel sessions. 
uh, about this type of signal. Um, okay, uh, so so at least in principle, we can in inject and recover these stochastic backgrounds, but that really ignores um, you know all the other things going on the Lisa bands, uh, of which you know there are quite a lot. Um, and as soon as we have perfect knowledge of the noise model and everything like that. Um, so, so one idea uh, we had is we, we could definitely take into account the uh, galactic binaries uh, if, if we could model them as a stochastic signal and then uh, chunk that signal uh, in time. So say, you know, independently fit um, for, for at least this amplitude, this A1 here, um, uh, every single month of the, of the LISA data. Um, and it, you know, in principle, this, the, the time variation should just depend on the, the antenna pattern of LISA relative to the galaxy. Um, and if you, if you fit these parameters uh, at six months of the galactic background, um, these are what you get. And so we took these to be uh, like a typical injection uh, and took priors, uh, white priors around them. Um, yeah, and, and when you're chunking the data in time like this, um, you can just assume the likelihood is a product of each uh, chunk's likelihood. So, uh, so here's uh, an injection and recovery of collective background with two different likelihoods and uh, 90 days of data chunked into two, two groups. Um, and so uh, the first chunk, the amplitude, the A1 was uh, 10 to the minus 10. The second chunk, it was 10 to the minus 11. So, uh, and all the other parameters were assumed to be constant between the two chunks. Um, so, so in that way, we're able to take into account the varying uh, galactic foreground um, while having some constant uh, parameters for the instrument noise or um, other parameters of the of the signal. And since we're inter interested in primordial signals, I thought it'd be a good idea to inject uh, one on top of this galactic foreground. <clears throat> so <clears throat> uh, this signal, uh, is the stochastic background you'd expect from a uh, spike in the primordial power spectrum. Uh, so if you, you know, tried to form primordial black holes of just a fixed mass or uh, have like a very sharp feature in an inflationary model, uh, this is the sort of signal you'd expect. It would be much smoother um, from a realistic model. Um, Uh, yeah, but um, this is this is a you know, sort of a model independent uh, rough shape of of this type of physics. Uh, so uh, we injected one of those um, and and tried to recover it. Here we took four months of data, and the galactic foreground has a different amplitude in each month, uh, and two of the months uh, overlap <laughs> uh, here in the middle. Uh, that's why you only see um, the purple, you don't see the, the green. Uh, but we're able to uh, recover that uh, quite well. And uh, yeah, take into account the varying galactic foregrounds. Uh, okay, um, so that's... Uh, more or less uh, our work so far. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm working on building up the Scastic Signal template library. Uh, yeah, and if anyone has a um, Scastic template I should take a look at, please, um, yeah, let me know. Happy to. Uh, we need to uh, integrate this into the global fit pipeline uh, so, so that would involve changing the noise model instead of just you know kind of the analytic two parameter uh, noise model. We need to um, work with the global fits noise model, so it's, it's, it's a little more complicated, non-parametric. Um, 
and ideally uh, make this kind of a trans-dimensional sampler so we can automatically figure out you know how many signals are are present in the data uh, and and what their characteristics are um, the cosmology working group has this sgw binner which is kind of a uh <clears throat> you know model independent um excess power sort of uh reconstruction of a stochastic background um which is kind of the you know a model agnostic approach um, and uh, also there's there are more sophisticated models of the confusion noise and in our, in our properties <laughs> um yeah this one from uh neil cornish and his postdoc back to bigman um looks very interesting so. okay so that's uh that's it anybody have questions thank you very much robert uh, uh any question for Ruby? quentin please Yes, uh, the, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I had a question, well, a bit technical, but, uh, you know, when you're analyzing uh, years or, or six months of worth of data, you have a lot of uh, frequency bins to consider. And so are you applying some kind of uh, averaging binning or, or smoothing like uh, like the SGW binner uh, to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make your analysis quicker? Um Oops. uh no I, i'm not uh for now <laughs> which is uh why i um i ran i ran at, at the likelihood in c to make it a little faster uh but yeah for now just taking the the raw uh for a data we generated um but I, I think you could smooth it and still get similar results um, yes i think so too okay <laughs> I, I, yeah That's, i think you could yeah. <laughs> But it's safer. It's safer to do uh, like yeah, row, I guess, especially right. when you have uh, spikes like uh, in your models, right? Right. Yeah. If you have like a a feature or you know, like a sharp frequency feature like this one. Um, yeah. Exactly. This would be yeah. complicated to yeah to smooth out. Yeah. Right. Right. Thanks. Sure. Sure. I have a question on this figure, the F star, what is the value of the F star typically because here you normalize the frequency by the F star, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess the short answer is whatever you want it to be. Um, <laughs> depend, <laughs> depends when, uh, when when the feature happens in, okay. in your model, so... Um. Okay. And, uh... I have a last question. You said that after a few, after 15 days, you were able to detect the signal. Right. Um, yeah, with the, uh, but, kind of like the, the Radler uh, type signal. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. It's a Radler type signal. That was quite high, in fact, yes. Yeah, it was quite loud, yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. Especially if you can use the T channel, you can you can detect it um, with, with only a few days, yeah. Okay. Stefano? Uh, ah. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> nice talk. Um, do you expect that if you leave the instrument noise completely free, so let's say 20 PSD values for on 20 frequency, uh, still the signature due to the rotation of the instrument would allow you to, to differentiate uh, a background from that? Uh, yeah, so my understanding, and somebody else should chime in if they know better, is that the, uh, the A, this, this likelihood isn't valid anymore because A, E, and T channels now have correlations if, uh, if the instrument's not stationary or if it's not equal arm. Um, so, but, but if the T channel should still let you disentangle the, um, the signal and the and the instrument response, I think. But I think the question of Stefano is more if we have a big uncertainty on the C A C E and C T, no? Mm -hmm. Yes, if we it, don't it, know anything about the noise, right? If you don't know anything, if you know very poor about C A C E and C T, how can you deal with that? 
Yeah. So, not an easy question. No. <laughs> yeah, not an easy question, but it's a key question. So is the sky modulation fingerprint sufficient to extract some information? That That's where I have hopes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we haven't really looked into that at all. Um, that's, that's a good question. I, I, I would expect you could still extract something, um, but, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm sure Quentin want to, oh, let's say Tyson, then Quentin, and Quentin will continue with this talk that is exactly on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, anyway. Oh, okay. good. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll defer to Quentin, but my answer, answer is yes. yes. Okay. Your answer is yes. Okay. I look forward to, to see it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roby. So, and uh, we'll switch to Quentin. Uh, Quentin, can you share your slide and, uh, and uh, start when you are ready? And I'm sure that you're exactly on the topic that we are starting. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, let's see. Sorry. Uh, um, we are not slide one. Okay. Perfect. Okay, you, you can see the first slide, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, um, so can I start? Yes, I can. <laughs> uh, so thank yes, you, Antoine. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizer for allowing me to talk today. So yeah, this is also about uh, gravitational wave uh, background detection. Uh, but focusing more on, uh, you know, uh, how to do it when you know very little about the noise. And this is a study that has been carried out with uh, Nikos Karnesis, Jean-Baptiste Pyle, um, Marc Besançon and Henri Musospe uh, and myself. And this is also related to a um, uh, noise knowledge requirement study that is going on within uh, the, the LISA science group of the consortium. Um, so I, I'll start by, uh, you know, setting the stage and uh, uh, stating the problem. Um, and I'll spend a little time of, uh, by um, listing the assumptions that we've made in this study um, and then present to you uh, the flexible modeling of noise that we uh, propose and then some uh, preliminary results. So, well, as you, as you know, and uh, as Robbie uh, has uh, very well explained, the, the, the finding a gravitational wave background uh, of primordial, I mean, uh, primordial origin is one of the main uh, LISA science objectives, and this is stated in the LISA science requirement documents, uh, where uh, the seventh science objective uh, states that uh, uh, this is important to understand them for their implications in cosmology and also in particle physics uh, beyond uh, the energies uh, uh, that are achievable by uh, current uh, uh, particle accelerators. Um, and uh, detecting or not detecting actually primordial uh, stochastic gravitational wave backgrounds is important because uh, you can constrain models uh, of uh, uh, the early universe, inflationary models, first order phase transitions, uh, and also explore uh, particle physics beyond the standard model. And so I have stolen this uh, uh, plot from Robert Cadwell, uh, showing you the landscapes, let's say, of uh, the, the detectors in the context of uh, uh, stochastic gravitational wave background detection. So we see that uh, with vanilla, for example, uh, inflation models, we don't expect to see any anything in, Lis in Lisbon uh, except for um, some particular uh, models of inflation, uh, but yes, uh, things like phase transitions, cosmic strings are, are maybe more likely to be seen. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've, I'll leave these uh, uh, considerations to the cosmologists. Um, and so um, uh, detecting, uh, I mean, th th there's been quite a lot of literature already about uh, stochastic backgrounds, um, especially uh, like you know, the, the detection and distinguishing between different types of uh, stochastic backgrounds uh, with parametrized uh, power spectral density models. Um, and um, as uh, Rabi mentioned, there was uh, this uh, uh, software called the SWG Binner, uh, uh, which is uh, detecting the, uh, agnostically uh, the gravitational wave backgrounds given a uh, PSD, uh, a noise PSD of known shape or at least parametrized. And it has al also been shown uh, by NAM uh, that uh, uh, this analysis can be sensitive to uh, the noise model you're picking. 
And so, so that's why uh, um, we think well, one major, major difficulty uh, uh, is uh, that we have to account very precisely for uh, the, the, the model, the noise model that we have uh, to allow for our detection. And um, we've seen that we cannot rely fully on the physical model of the noise that we have prior, prior to the flight. Uh, we've seen that with LISA Pathfinder. Uh, we, uh, before the flight, the, 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 the noise model was uh, overestimating the performance. And actually, uh, that was good that we had a better performance. But that shows us that we can um, um, not, not anticipate all the effects uh, of the uh, of the instrument, and uh, we need to be prepared to that. So um, uh, we think we need um, two things. Well, the, the first is a robust and flexible uh, model for the noise, and second, of course, uh, realistic instrumental data simulations to test uh, the robustness of this uh, model. So this is uh, our, what our study is about. Um, of course, uh, we cannot avoid making assumptions, and that's why uh, I will uh, uh, tell you what the assumptions that we have done uh, in this study. So, uh, first of all, we are using time varying unequal arms uh, um, constellation, um, where the satellites follow Keplerian orbits. So, this is okay. We think we don't think that uh, using more uh, realistic orbits provided by ESA will uh, significantly change the, the results, but we will test that. Um, also, uh, we um, are using an isotropic stochastic gravitational wave background. We are assuming that this is isotropic and this uh, uh, leads to uh, approximately stationary process. Uh, that's related to Stefano's question, actually, but I will uh, talk a little bit more about that. And um, uh, one crucial assumption is that we assume that the PSD uh, uh, of the noise is smooth on, on uh, time scale, oh, I'm sorry, on frequency scales of the millihertz. Um, and uh, we use uh, time delay interferometry uh, of second generation. Um, we use the pseudo orthogonal uh, variable A, E, and T, and we assume in our analysis uh, 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 that they are orthogonal. Uh, this is okay uh, in first approximation. Uh, we've also tested this assumption. And uh, uh, we do a strong assumption here also that all the interferometer noises are have the, the same level, uh, which is not what we expect to be in reality. So uh, we'll have to relax this assumption in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, one thing also is that uh, we are we having a template-based search uh, as Rabi. Um, and so this, this, I think, is OK if we are doing uh, model comparisons. But of course, we can go beyond that, uh, like uh, agnostic searches. And last but not least, uh, we assume that all detectable gravitational wave sources have been removed from the data. Uh, so this is a, a big work before. Um, so to just to give examples about these assumptions, here is the stationary assumption. So variations of uh, the power spectral density of the stochastic gravitational wave background as a function of time uh, during one year of mission uh, for uh, the TDI variables A and E. Uh, so these variations are uh, one part to the thousand. So these are not uh, uh, a lot. And uh, uh, we've not uh, tested that yet, but um, we don't think we can go beyond the like 10% level uh, for short time scales in, in, in terms of PSD estimation precision. But uh, uh, maybe that's that's possible. But uh, anyway, uh, in our study, we assume that uh, uh, the background is stationary. Uh, another example of um, assumptions test is the orthogonality. Uh, so here uh, we have plotted in red the power spectral density of the sensitive uh, TDI variables, A and E, basically. And in black, you have the, the cross spectral densities of uh, um, between in between all, all of these uh, variables, A, E, and T. And we see that they are a bit more uh, lower than one order of magnitudes uh, with respect to the P PSD. So we can say that uh, the orthogonality assumption is OK. Um, so uh, Coming back to uh, this modeling that we uh, we've come uh, um, with uh, is um, uh, so to do robust detection, uh, we use a generic noise model with wide priors, and uh, um, we want also to uh, inject in our analysis uh, uh, firm knowledge about what we know 
uh, the best. And uh, uh, what we know the best are uh, the differences between uh, how uh, gravitational waves and noise enter the measurements. So the, basically the, the differences in the transfer functions. We may not know uh, um, in absolute value the, the very well the transfer functions. However, we know them relatively. And so the model that we use is uh, uh, basically the TDI data in the Fourier domain, which is equal to a, a signal term, um, which is expressed as a transfer function times uh, um, the, the gravitational wave strain. And the transfer function includes the, the projection onto the arms uh, of LISA and also the TDI response. And regarding the noise part, uh, we have also a transfer function, which is basically uh, the TDI response although it, this can uh, change you know, for certain types of noise. And uh, we have uh, one uh, uh, single link noise vector, which, is, which has uh, six entries. These are basically the science interferometer uh, measurements. And so if you uh, uh, consider the power spectral density of D, then you can uh, uh, split it in two parts, right? The, the, the signal part and the noise part, where you have a response functions uh, as a function of frequency that you assume uh, to be known. And you have uh, two models, SH for uh, the signal and SN for the noise, which are respectively described by the parameters theta H and theta N. Um, and so here is the uh, modeling of the noise that we adopt. Uh, we assume that the log power spectral density of the noise can be expressed as uh, um, a sum of spline uh, uh, functions. And uh, so this is agnostic like uh, with respect to any noise model. Um, and the, the, the parameters that we estimate are the spline coefficients and the spline knots or uh, more uh, precisely uh, the uh, frequency knot locations and also the, the, the frequency uh, knot uh, lev um, levels, the amplitudes of the knots. And um, regarding the power spectral density of the gravitational wave background, uh, this is, yes, a simple power law model um, uh, that could, uh, yes, represent uh, the effect of cosmic strings, um, for example, uh, where uh, you have only two parameters, so the, the energy density and uh, the power law index. So uh, here are some results that we we got um, first on the simulation side um, as i said we were trying to um, uh, like having at least a different process to generate the data and to analyze them uh, so here we are generating a stochastic gravitational wave background uh, in the time domain uh, with the software lisa gw response uh, uh, implemented by uh, jean baptiste et al and so we've basically, you know, um, a few hundreds of uh, independent pixels simulated in the sky, so generated independently and uh, um, measured over one uh, year observation time. And for the noise, uh, this is less realistic for now. Uh, we plan to improve that in the future. Uh, we generated from a, a prescribed power spectral density in the time domain uh, with independent realizations uh, on the six uh, uh, links on six science inter uh, interferometer measurements. And then once we have uh, the single links measurements, we, we apply the time delay interferometry uh, uh, transformation, uh, second generation. And uh, we use the Pi TDI software developed by Martin and Stab, uh, Martin Stab et al. And uh, here is an example of what you get. So on the left hand side, you have uh, the, the TDI A as a function of frequency. In purple, you have the stochastic background. Uh, uh, and in gray, you have the noise. And on the right hand side, you have the T channel, where, uh, as expected, you see that you have a more uh, attenuation of the gravitational wave signal. Uh, regarding the analysis, uh, we, we estimate both noise and and, per, and uh, stochastic gravitational wave background parameters in the frequency domain, this time with the frequency domain model, uh, using Bayesian analysis, where we sample for uh, uh, the posteriors uh, using uh, parallel tempered uh, Mark, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And um, we use, well, uniform priors for uh, the gravitational wave parameters, but more importantly, we use a kind of a wide prior on the noise PSD. We allow it to uh, vary uh, one order of magnitude above or below uh, uh, the uh, physical model that we have, so the true uh, power spectral density. 
and then we we uh, adopt a, a detection process uh, in a Bayesian way, right? With two hypotheses, uh, uh, hypothesis uh, H naught, where you have only noise in the data, and hypothesis H two H one, where you have uh, noise uh, and signal in the data, and then. Uh, we compare the evidences uh, using uh, uh, thermodyn thermodynamical integration uh, and computing the base factor between the two models. Uh, so, uh, yes, as, as an example, and this is preliminary, we, we are um, uh, uh, able to recover um, stochastic gravitational wave background parameters in, in uh, um, and both the noise uh, parameters in a, in a lot of different uh, uh, con configurations of the parameters. And here is an example where, uh, uh, so in, in black, you have the estimated um, power spectral density of the single link uh, PSD of the noise, right? Not at the TDI level, but at the uh, single link level. And uh, these red uh, lines that you see are the uh, estimated not locations with respect to uh, the dashed lines which represent the, the not location that were initially set uh, before uh, running the MCMC. Uh, and on the on the bottom plot you have uh, uh, some residual plots uh, like on of the ratio between the estimated PSD and the, the true PSD. So uh, uh, we yeah I should say that we have also probed uh, the optimal number of nodes uh, using, um, uh, you know, a transdimensional MCMC. This is uh, Nikos Karnazis that has done this uh, uh, analysis, and uh, uh, we 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 use the, the optimal number of nodes in our analysis. Um, and regarding bias factors, uh, we we show that we are uh, able in with these assumptions to um, uh, detect uh, or not detect. A, uh, stochastic gravitational wave background with uh, this simple model um, uh, depending on uh, yeah the, their SNR um, so uh, we have um, we have different base factor depending on the strength of uh, of the energy density uh, of the power speed uh, of the yes uh, of the stochastic background and we're planning also to probe um, a, a wide range of uh, parameter space like uh, the uh, power law index and uh, and the energy density um, so, as, as a conclusion, uh, uh, here we are uh, trying to assume no prior knowledge uh, on the noise shape except its smoothness and also um, its uh, transfer function. And we demonstrated that uh, with uh, some range of assumptions, detection is possible, but we need to go beyond, right? Uh, so we need to, to use more realistic assumptions. Um, so, for example, different noise levels in the interferometers. And as we said before, this will, uh, uh, you know, uh, force us to use um, uh, models for non-diagonal terms of the covariance matrix. And uh, also include other stochastic processes as the galaxy uh, is uh, important and the ultimate goal maybe is uh, trying to do a full agnostic estimation of both signal and noise. Uh, this is uh, not uh, um, like certain to be to be possible, but we'll see how far we can go in this uh, uh, idea. So thank you for your attention. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you, Quentin. Uh, we have question, Stas. Hey, Kanta, uh, very nice. I have Hi. first cl cl clarification. Can you go a uh, slide up? It's not log B, it's B, right? It's 10 to the 3, it's a B, base factor. Mm, I think it's log. Uh, so uh, B is 10 power 10 to the 3? <laughs> um, yeah, is... maybe, maybe I got that wrong indeed. Um... Because it would be huge. Yes, it's clearly a yes. evidence. <laughs> yes, so maybe yes, you're, you're right. I, this is uh, this is B. Uh, in, in, since I actually I did the extreme evidence uh, for H one is uh, is put at uh, this value in in red, so that means that uh, this is B, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, my question is about your conclusion. So you mentioned a few shortcomings in uh, your analysis so far. It's one is the um, uh, assumption of the same noise, another is um, 
uh, I already forgot. One is the, that uh, all the other sources are removed and that the, there are no other stochastic rotation wave signals. Which yes. one do you think will be the most severe out of these? Uh, and maybe one more is a uh, non orthogonality of A, E, and T. Which one of these mm. could be the most severely affecting your current results? What do you think? Yes. yes. Um... So let's say we, we apply this uh, analysis without changing anything and uh, uh, yeah, relax the assumptions. Uh, I think uh, we will get um, bad estimates of the uh, variance, uh, I mean, the, the uncertainties if we don't include the, uh, you know, off diagonal terms of the covariance. Um, but of course, I think uh, not having a proper removal uh, through the global fit of uh, all of the sources uh, is is the most uh, is the most crucial thing here uh, because um, um, even though you're probing a, a you know wide range of frequency bandwidths, I think uh, this is uh, uh, th this kind of uh, analysis are very sensitive. But maybe people have uh, other you know uh, um, insights about this. Thank you, Stefano. Sorry, I have one million question. I'll ask one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, please. <laughs> uh, if uh, I mean, how much the orthogonality matters? Because obviously, the orthogonality goes through the fact that you assume equal noise on the virus detector, right? And yes, the exactly. One, uh, the second one is that the transfer function of the noise should play no role because if you leave the model of the noise completely free and the noise is stationary, uh, you know, you can include the transfer function in the noise model, right? So it must be the time modulation due to the rotation of the, of, of the constellation plus the orthogonality that allow you to discriminate. What is your sense? What is discriminating between the two? So, uh, well, you have one uh, main difference, right, uh, between the, the, the transfer functions of the noise and the stochastic background is that uh, you have, uh, you know, this, this projection onto the arms that you can trace back. So, uh, the, this, uh, there is no, not only, you know, the, the TDI uh, transfer function obviously is common, but uh, then you have a, a, a different process, uh, like, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, measurements in the different interferometric channels. So I, th I think that's uh, that's important to take, uh, I mean, to, to, to mm -hmm. take into account. The other thing uh, about time variations, when you have, um, uh, you, you know, um, um, uh, iso isotropic uh, stochastic background, then the additions of all the, the, the sources in the sky basically uh, make uh, the uh, resulting stochastic process very, you know, time time independence, but there is some uh, some time dependencies that we could exploit, right? Uh, I mean, this this is what I, I showed here. This is this is tiny, right? So um, I don't know if you had this particular uh, kind of effects in mind uh, yeah, for no, discrimination. It, yeah, I've lost your answer because I have a shaky connection, but uh, I mean, what allows to discriminate noise from noise if, I mean, the projection, the projection effect if it is not time varying, it's just a number. Um, well, it's uh, it's 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 a ve it's a matrix, right? Yeah, so, okay. so if it's a matrix, then uh, you you have uh, more than uh, one scale factor to. Uh, okay. to use. I, I, I think I'm taking too much time. Thank you. <laughs> no, 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 but but it's interesting. Uh, I think we can, we can spend one hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Olaf. Uh, yes, hi. Yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I think the question, you can probably guess what it is because we spoke about it a few times before. Uh, mm -hmm. Did I understand correctly that you that you still only assume a single uh, noise uh, parameter for each measurement that you have? So you don't distinguish between different noise sources? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is still correct. And uh, I... I mean, I started, uh, you know, analyzing the more realistic si uh, simulations with uh, this uh, model, uh, but however, uh, we, this is still what is assumed in the analysis process, um, okay. which, which is, uh, which is, uh, as we know, uh, uh, not realistic. Uh, um, so we'll, we'll see uh, uh, to which extent this, uh, you know, this assumption will break, um, like starting just with, uh, you know, having a more realistic uh, 
uh, simulations that John Baptiste has prepared actually already. So yeah, just need time to do that. Okay, thanks. I'm curious of the result. <laughs> yeah, yes. And Roby, for the last question. Oh, uh, great talk. Um, from the phone. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess I was wondering if you've done, if you did any comparisons with like a, a dumber noise model, just with like, um, you know, like a two parameter fit. Uh, uh, and also, like which which frame is the stochastic background isotropic in? Is it like um, aligned with the CMB frame or, or what? Hmm. Yeah, good question. So we don't take into account uh, the dipole, uh, uh, you know, anisotropy due to um, the the reference frame. Yes, uh, uh, of the like of our galaxy with respect to the CMB. So um, this yes, this is actually. Uh, uh, I mean, investigated by Henri in Chospe and uh, has been also um, uh, investigated by other studies, uh, but I don't know, uh, I don't remember them in top of my head, but uh, uh, yes, this is this is something that uh, Henri is looking at, but this is not in this simulation. Okay, cool. cool. Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions or no more million of questions, uh, <laughs> Uh, let's uh, thank you, Quentin, again, and thank then you. Uh, we will uh, switch to Natalia. Natalia, are you ready and ready to share your slide? Uh, hi. Uh, yes. Hi, Natalia. Let me try. Um, uh, can you see them? Yes. Not yet in the presenter mode, but we will yes, be thinking of. And now we have a black screen. <laughs> oh, oh no! I think I have a black, a black screen. Uh, let me do this, and then it probably will work. It's because they switched to another screen. Yes, it works. It? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Natalia Korsakova. I'm a postdoc at APC in Paris, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the fast current estimation for massive black hole binaries uh, with normalizing flows. Uh, so first I wanted to give a little bit of uh, the motivation why, uh, why, we want to, why it is important to do that. Uh, so we are going to look at the uh, massive black hole binaries and probably uh, most of you know that uh, what sort of sources are there and uh, where they are located. Uh, in our sensitivity band. And uh, the important um, aspect why we want to do fast parameter estimation for them uh, is that many studies, they uh, predict that there will be electromagnetic counterparts. So some uh, say that there will be electromagnetic counterparts during merger. Some say that there might be even some during the spiral phase. And uh, there are different theories that they might be due to the matter or presence of the magnetic fields. Uh, but what is important for us is uh, if we want to do the simultaneous observation of the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic signal, we uh, want to be able to do fast parameter estimation uh, to predict, um, I would say, the sky localization uh, for the signal. Um, so, um, uh, to, to just um, uh, give the context uh, is that usually when we do parameter estimation, we always use the bias equation and we estimate our posterior distribution on parameters. Um, and we assume uh, for x, we assume the data model, which is the sum of the waveform and the measurement noise. Now, the problem with this equation is that um, we cannot uh, have the exact solution for the marginal likelihood. Uh, therefore, we need to find some sort of approximations to that. Uh, so one way to do this approximation is to do some sort of sampling technique to do the approximate inference with MCMC or NASA sampling. And the problem that can be with this method is that this would require the likelihood evaluation and that could be a rather slow. Uh, so the other um, way is to use some variational inference. Uh, in this case, 
uh, when you approximate the posterior distribution with some other attractable distribution. Um, some people are looking into that, but we are not going to talk into, about this uh, here. Um, the other way uh, is to do the exact inference, but to simplify the model. And uh, the easiest thing is to do the Gaussian mixture model, for example, uh, but this can be too simple. And the other way is to do the invertible models. And the invertible models is what we are going to talk about today. So uh, just to give a simple example or, um, that, that sort of helps to understand how it works, and actually it works in a very simple way, <laughs> is that um, if you have, for example, a random variable and you know it's a cumulative distribution function, uh, then uh, you can um, sample, the, sample, some, um, sample some random variables uh, uniformly distributed on uh, interval from zero to one and then project it uh, using this cumulative distribution function and get your uh, probability distribution. This is just a sort of uh, simple one-dimensional explanation of how it works. And uh, then you can just, um, using the change of variable equation for the probability density function, applying uh, the chain rule, come up uh, to, 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 the, to, to the equation that you are going to use to do this invertible transform. So this idea is, uh, is very simple. Um, so, uh, and uh, the way how we are going to apply to the real problem uh, is usually called normalizing flows, because in our case, we sample not from the uniform distribution, but we rather sample from the normal distribution. And uh, why uh, would it be fast is that uh, it would be very fast to sample from the normal distribution, and then we want to uh, somehow find a way how we can project uh, samples from this normal distribution to a more complex distribution. And what we are going to do, we're just going to find this function that would be the bijective transformation uh, that would allow us to do uh, this projection. So uh, how are we going to, to uh, to find this function, we are going to do this using the change of variable equation. So uh, that's a very simple equation, and we just need to um, put some constraints on this equation. So first, uh, as we already said, uh, the function has to be a bijection. Uh, then um, uh, this function has to be differentiable, and its, uh, its inverse also has to be differentiable. And then, uh, because you use here the determinant of the Jacobian, this determinant of Jacobian has to be tractably invertible. So if we put these constraints, uh, we can uh, cook up our uh, invertible function and make this transformation possible. Um, the other practical constraint that we have to impose uh, is that the calculation of the Jacobian determinant is actually quite slow. Uh, so we need to find a way to speed it up. And so we can make it either small or on the diagonal matrix, or one of the ways is to make it a trigonal matrix because uh, the, the determinant would be just the product of the elements on the diagonal. Uh, so taking all these assumptions into account, uh, we think of uh, how, how can we construct this transform. Uh, so one of the first uh, proposed uh, methods uh, for, for this model was to use uh, simple affine transformation. Affine transformation is just a location scale transformation when you uh, apply the scale and the shift to your variable. And then the log uh, Jacobian uh, becomes the sum uh, of the log uh, of the scale coefficients. So very simple. And um, then the other, uh, uh, the other problem that has to be taken into account uh, is that if we want to uh, work uh, with uh, multidimensional spaces, we need to find uh, uh, the way to sort of incorporate the correlation between the different uh, dimensions. And uh, the way it was proposed uh, to be done uh, is with a coupling transform. So in that case, we uh, sort of separate our space into two parts and we uh, fix one, uh, we keep one part fixed and then we uh, 
uh, transform the other part using uh, the, the input from, uh, from the first part. And uh, we do the same in the backward transformation. Um, so the, one of the first methods that was proposed uh, to, to implement uh, um, the normalizing flows was called uh, real non-volume preserving flows, flow. And uh, so in this method, uh, the coupling transformation is combined uh, with a fine transformation. And um, basically the transformation can be described uh, by this uh, set of equations. And the important thing is that um, when you do the transformation back, uh, you just analytically can express this in terms of two functions, which which sort of represents your scale and your uh, your shift. And now uh, the question is how we can make this expressive and how uh, we can uh, estimate uh, these functions T and S. And uh, uh, these functions we can uh, parameterize uh, by the neural network. We can choose, uh, in principle, any sort of the uh, architecture. And uh, by parameterizing it by neural network, we can make uh, this transformation very expressive uh, because we can um, have millions of parameters and have very nonlinear functions. Uh, so uh, the, the, the transforms that we use in the practice, we use the combination of this uh, non-really uh, 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 real MVP and uh, we use it combined with neural spline flows uh, because neural spline flows have demonstrated themselves uh, in the literature to be one of the most expressive uh, of uh, these flows. So they also uh, have a possibility of using a coupling transform, uh, but in addition to that, instead of using the affine transformation, uh, they use monotonic rational quadratic spline transform. Um, so sim uh, what they do, they simply take uh, their parameter space, um, they put several nodes in this parameter space, and then they fit the spline. And when you uh, do the inverse transformation, uh, it is quite easy uh, to invert uh, this spline. Um, now, the, when we looked um, at how we can uh, go uh, from the samples from normal distribution to our posterior distribution and back, uh, we can uh, ask us, uh, ourselves uh, a question. So uh, what do we do actually in the case of, of the gravitation waves? Because uh, we don't have access to, um, to the direct samples from the posterior. How, uh, how can we... Uh, um, how can we have access to the information uh, from from this uh, uh, um, from this sample? So, uh, what we uh, what we do uh, we uh, we say that we know our prior, and then uh, we sample a sample from the prior. But then, in addition to that, uh, because uh, we know. Um, uh, we assume that we know the sort of the noise of our detector, uh, we can generate the simulated data. And by generating the simulated data, they, we can say that we have access to the joint sample. And uh, therefore, uh, we can condition our transform on this joint sample. And uh, then uh, we train uh, our network in a way uh, that we go uh, from the prior conditioned on the joint sample uh, to the normal distribution. And when we want to sample uh, and actually get our posterior distribution, uh, we condition our samples from their uh, normal distribution on the real data. Um, and in practice, what we do, we compose a lot of uh, uh, a lot of transformations. So we have uh, uh, several types of transforms, and we repeat them many times because uh, the more sort of you do that, uh, the more expressive your transformations can be. And here is just a sort of a schematic representation uh, that this. Um, uh, uh, these transformations, actually, what they kind of do, uh, they estimate uh, uh, the surface uh, 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 and they uh, kind of uh, start from uh, 
flat surface and then they curve the surface and then they get uh, uh, like that you 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 get their uh, surface of your posterior dis distribution um, for the optimization uh, we use uh, we uh, train it by maximizing the total log likelihood of the data uh, with respect uh, uh, to the parameters of the transform. Uh, what this means, um, what it is equivalent to, is that uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, minimize uh, the cool block library divergence between the normal distribution and uh, the samples that are transformed from the samples that we sample from the prior. And when we transform them to the normal distribution, we just sort of try to make our samples as normal as possible. Um, the other problem that uh, we are facing is that uh, 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 the waveforms, especially for LISA, they're quite long. And um, we need to find the way how we can compress these waveforms. Uh, so to compress uh, these waveforms, uh, we can um, uh, try to find uh, different bases uh, on which we can project them, uh, in which uh, the data would be more optimally represented. And for that, we use uh, the most uh, sort of simple way how it can be done. Uh, we use uh, singular value decomposition and we uh, decompose the matrix that we can uh, we construct a matrix of a big um, sort of uh, uh, array of uh, the waveforms and then uh, from this matrix we uh, find uh, the the preferred directions in the, this new basis and then uh, for each new waveform uh, we construct uh, we project uh, this waveform on this uh, new basis and we just take uh, the several a few coefficients that are enough uh, for the reconstruction of the waveform um, so here are some preliminary results uh, we, we are still uh, in the progress of, uh, of getting, uh, getting the final results. The problem seems, to, uh, the problem happened to be uh, quite complicated actually because the signals for LISA have quite high SNR and uh, it is uh, not, so easy, uh, not so easy to fit them, but we are almost there and just uh, uh, some uh, results also on the intrinsic parameters and here is a plot of the here is the PP plot showing that we can fit uh, these parameters quite well. And uh, as a conclusion, um, just want to make a, a state that this is a uh, an independent method to do the Bayesian parameter estimation. And then it is, uh, it is of course, it takes uh, time to train, uh, but it is uh, fast in the execution. Uh, so this can be uh, used, this is much faster than sampling, it just takes uh, several seconds and um, therefore it can be super useful to do, uh, to use for the low latency pipeline for LISA. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Thank you, Natalia. Um, we have questions from Tyson. Yeah, yeah so, so turning... I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking about this in a slightly, slightly different direction, direction so I, I'm, I'm thinking about after you've done the slow sampling and you have a bunch of discrete samples from this complicated distribution, and then we eventually want to make those as useful data products for people. And so coming up with a high fidelity way of turning those discrete samples into a continuous distribution that is easy to package up for end users to take advantage of, is a, I think, an unsolved problem, and I think a really, really useful one. So can you see how this approach could be used in the other direction? If I handed you samples, oh, how uh, would you then? Uh, yes, so if I correctly understood your question, uh, you say that you already, uh, if you already have access to the samples from the posterior, right, but they are not, um, that they are with a low fidelity and you don't have so many of them, right? How can you, um, uh, uh, can you uh, sort of improve your resolution and produce more samples? Uh, so it, Audio. The, the question was, let, let's say we have adequately sampled 
Right, so sorry, so I, 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 I can't hear you very well. Uh, you have you have you had echo. I know you had echo, and you are weak, so it's harder. Tyson, the answer is yes. You can use this. <laughs> can, can, can can Tyson repeat, and I can answer this. Uh, I can try to repeat what Tyson said, that's why I'm answering. So basically, imagine you have posterior samples from some distribution and dimensional distribution. And the, using this tool to convert this uh, discrete samples and some continuous function, which is very fast. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So so that what I thought I understood from what Tyson said. Yes, the answer is yes. And the answer is that this is actually easier problem. Uh, so, because in this case, uh, now you are you are trying when you estimate this transform, uh, you are trying to condition it on uh, additional data. But you, if you already have access to the samples from the posterior, uh, you can uh, estimate uh, the function that would allow you to sample samples from the same posterior. So you would sort of fit uh, uh, fit the the surface to your to your posterior distribution. Tyson, are you satisfied? I, I, hope, I hope I answered the correct question. <laughs> you don't want to speak anymore. How do you guarantee the transform? Uh, so uh, to guarantee that you, uh, so Senvan is asking, how do you guarantee the transform and its inverse are differentiable? Well, uh, the way uh, you <clears throat> you guarantee that is that you construct it <laughs> in a way it is like that. So when you construct your transform, you have to follow these uh, uh, three conditions, and you just construct your functions in the way uh, that you can guarantee that. Uh, so Tyson has a follow-up question: uh, Is the product uh, is the product of getting this uh, continuous distribution packageable? Yeah, could uh, could be distributed as one of the data products uh, as part of the catalog? Uh, yes, um, uh, yes, we can. It can be distributed. Um, as a software, maybe. So, for example, for uh, the production of the spritz data, uh, we, uh, when we were sampling from Lisa Pathfinder distribution, uh, the parameters of the glitches, uh, we produced a software which can uh, sample you from uh, this distribution and sort of distributed the software. So that can be uh, uh, can be distributed in the form of in the form of software. So when you just tell uh, tell it uh, uh, produce me um, uh, one million samples, and that would it will do it. Okay. I know so it will involve a pre-trained network. So you would uh, uh, you would distribute the software plus uh, the, the 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 estimated uh, weights of the network. Okay, so you train the network before. Yes, yeah, so you train the network before, and then you uh, you distribute it together with parameters of this network. Okay, uh, I know that you like self self sharing, but there is a question from Michael. <laughs> Uh, Ty, great talk. Um, just wondering, I know in the ground-based case, they kind of had to do some special setup, I think, to deal with uh, not knowing the noise up front or, or like, you know, in terms of training, uh, including information about changing noise. I was just wondering if you have looked at that at all or thought about that or anything about the noise in the context of Lisa. Uh, so I haven't done this yet. Uh, here I just assume uh, simple noise uh, that you just sample from in a usual way from the PSD. Uh, but in principle, because uh, you create uh, your training data as one representation from of the waveform sampled uh, from the prior uh, plus the noise, you can also vary your noise in a different way. So you can um, put a different uh, models for the noise variation, and then you can incorporate this in your training data so that that's possible to do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions for Natalia?
If not, uh, thank you, Natalia, for the nice talk. And thank you, all the speakers of this session for this uh, very nice session, I guess. Uh, I think we will close the session. I remind you that we will have uh, an LDC uh, workshop uh, at, I think it's 5.45, correct? Natalia, you are the chair of the LDC. So. <laughs> yeah, in, in 15 minutes. Yes, today so, will be a parameter estimation for galactic binaries and for... Sorry, we lost parameter estimation for galactic binary and... Massive black hole binaries as well. Thank you, Quentin. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice, we have all the chairs. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you all for this nice session and I think we can close the session as there yes yes that's uh, everything thank you Antoine and all the speakers and uh, enjoy the uh, workshop otherwise we'll see you again tomorrow bye. thank you bye bye